Welcome to Scripture Insights. I'm Taylor Halverson. And I'm Mike Harris. Today, we're gonna to talk about the title page of the Book of Mormon, the introductory material, and the witnesses to the Book of Mormon. Great way to start the Book of Mormon, the title page, which originally was the last leaf in the Book of Mormon, is now at the very front of the Book of Mormon. It is scripture. In fact, if you open up to the title page and you check this out, we have two paragraphs. And you might even number them, one and two. We could even call this chapter zero of the Book of Mormon with verse one and verse two. The next page is the introduction, useful explanatory material provided by the Church Scripture Committee many decades ago. Now it's important to recognize this is not scripture, but it's useful oriented material. And then of course we have the witnesses, the three and the eight, and also testimony of Joseph Smith. So we'll spend our time today talking about the title page and some insights from these other materials. So Mike, as you, you spend a lot of your life helping people engage with the scriptures as a teacher. And when you help students get into the title page, what are some of the things that you hope for them to see and to take out of the title page? Right off the bat, we need to notice the title of this book. It changed in 1982. It used to be just the Book of Mormon. But in 1982, to help emphasize the purpose of the Book of Mormon, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in the First Presidency unanimously decided that we were going to call it the Book of Mormon, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. And I think that's paramount. As we go through the Book of Mormon this year, we want to make sure that we're always trying to see Jesus Christ and draw closer to Him. We don't want to miss the mark. And there's a clear call. When we use the phrase, another testament of Jesus Christ, there should be an immediate reference to the Old Testament and to the New Testament, which both witness of the work of God, Jesus as the Old Testament Jehovah, and Jesus the Christ in the New Testament. The Book of Mormon is a companion volume. And you were saying to me earlier that if we want to understand the Book of Mormon, we read it with the Bible. And if we want to understand the Bible, these other testaments of Jesus Christ, we read the Book of Mormon. And so another testament, we can understand it to mean as another witness of Jesus Christ. By the mouth of two or three witnesses shall the word of God be established. And in fact, here in the second paragraph, it says um, that it's written also to the convincing of the Jew and the Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. I, I remember a general authority, Elder Rudd, he was given a devotional and he was talking about when he was in seminary, the teacher had on the wall, everybody's name down one column, and then had the, the books in the Book of Mormon. And every time you finished one of the books, you got a star. When you read First Nephi, you got a star. When you read Second Nephi, you got a star. And everybody could see everybody's progress. I don't know if that's wise to do, but he, well, Elder Rudd was so competitive, he made sure he was the first one to finish. And he says, and guess what I gained by the time I finished reading the Book of Mormon? He says, I got stars. He says, but I did not get a testimony of Jesus Christ because I was reading it for the wrong reasons. So again, we need to make sure that we ask ourselves, what am I learning about Jesus Christ and, and his atoning sacrifice? Excellent. So as we mentioned, there are essentially two verses here, paragraph one, paragraph two, and each are expressing key ideas for us to understand God's work. We've mentioned that the title page of the Book of Mormon was the last leaf in the plates. So the way it worked in the ancient world, when you would compose a book, and by the way, not that many people were literate, so it's really impressive that Mormon, Moroni, Nephi, other Book of Mormon writers had literacy and ability to write. So you write a book, you would put the conclusion or the introduction, which really should be the same thing, at the end of the book. After the book is complete, you know how to summarize it. That's what's happening here in the title page. So it pays well for you to look carefully at what are the themes that God's prophet Moroni is inviting us to pay attention to in the Book of Mormon. We have highlighted Jesus Christ and that is first and foremost. So as you engage in the Book of Mormon, where are you seeing that it is a witness of Jesus Christ? We also see that it's, uh, I'm gonna jump down to the second paragraph, 
God wants to show unto the remnant of the house of Israel what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers. Why? That they may know the covenants of the Lord, that they are not cast off forever. Now, I find this critically important because in the ancient world, covenantal relationships were paramount. And God is a covenantal God who has bound himself to us. Or more specifically, he has entered into a covenant to offer us salvation and his grace. And there's nothing we can do to break that offering. It's his work. Now, we can walk away from it. It'd be like the sun shining and I close the curtains and say, I don't want the sun in my life. And part of what God is trying to do, among other things, with the Book of Mormon, is to give strong evidence of the great things that he has done to show covenantal loyalty and faithfulness to his people so that we know that we're not cast off forever. It's an invitation for us to say, wow, if God has been this faithful to me, even though I don't deserve it, if the Israelites, who have been so unfaithful to God, and yet he still welcomes them, what can I be doing to receive his everlasting mercy? You used the word chesed with me earlier. It's a, a Hebrew word that means covenant loyalty. Yeah. And the KJV translators, when they saw chesed, they would sometimes translate it as everlasting kindness. Um, what were the other ones? Uh, kindness, this love. Um, mercy. Mercy. Yeah, it's this idea. Sometimes we say, oh, he broke his covenant. And I, I get what we're saying, but maybe we should be careful and maybe not say that. Right. Because the covenant is still, in t I mean, here are these, these Lamanites who are inflicting genocide on the Nephites and they're depraved. And the Lord's like, you know what, though? They are the house of Israel. They come from the covenant. I can't forget them. Even when we sin and we don't feel worthy and maybe we're not worthy, the covenant is still there. The Lord's still going to, we're not keeping our covenants, but the Lord's always keeping his. I think that's what you were trying to emphasize there. Yeah, I find that really empowering to me because hopefully I'm not as bad as the Lamanites or the Nephites, but there are times that I have not been as faithful and loyal to God as I should be. And there have been times in my life where I felt like, well, that's it. I've lost everything. And God, this record, the Book of Mormon, is a witness that you cannot destroy God's love. You cannot hide God's love. It is there. And the Book of Mormon, he says, to show unto them, unto the remnant of the house of Israel, what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers. And you might look in your own life. What great things has the Lord done for you? He is calling to us again and again to witness that I am your God. I want to be, have you as my people. I find it so compelling that no matter how much I fall or wander or stray, I can come back and he is still unmovable waiting for me. I love that. And isn't it so cool here at the very beginning in the first paragraph, right from the start, Moroni writes that this book is written to the Lamanites. How, I mean, the Lamanites kill his father, Mormon. They, they did unspeakable things to the women and children. And it's, it's like Jesus Christ has endowed Moroni with this charity, this love for his enemies. That's, that's the power of the covenant. The Lord can, if we will stay, if we strive, we, like you said, Taylor, we don't always do as good as we could and should with our covenants, but as we sincerely strive to keep the covenants we've made with the Lord in the waters of baptism and in the temple, the Lord can help us do miraculous things like Moroni and love people that otherwise would be absolutely impossible on our own, with our own strength. I love also the promises. Here's Moroni wandering alone for years, decades, and he has seen all these atrocities. And he takes the time to say, this book is written to those people who are actually my brothers. I am going to mm. love my neighbor. 
even though they haven't they haven't given a reason for them to be loved god has given me a reason to love them he also says things like uh, written and sealed up the record is written and sealed up and hid up under the lord that they might not be destroyed so why is it so important this record not be destroyed remember we mentioned about this is a collection of evidences of the great things that god has done for his people so I try to keep a regular journal, and in that I try to record stories of things that God has done for me that have mattered to me. And then when I'm having a difficulty in my life, it's another source I can turn to of what great things God has done for me. Because as a human, my fallen nature, I sometimes forget and have to be reminded, what are the great things God has done? And here's Moroni, who has seen some of the worst tragedy ever, and yet, He's inspired by the Spirit to record the stories and to seal them up that they might not be destroyed so that we might know the great evidence of what God has done for his people and will do for us. And so I encourage you to take time to reflect and express gratitude to God for what great things he has done in your life and share that with other people and record it. Even if your life is literally falling apart, you're all alone, <laughs> no friends, yeah. still look for the, the mercies of the Lord in your life. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. There is so much more we could talk about here in the title page. It's such a, a powerful introduction. I've read a lot of books. And of all the books I've read, I can't think of a book that more powerfully expresses its own purpose. Look at how this ends. Of all the things the Book of Mormon is trying to do, including witnessing of Jesus Christ, the very last phrase, that ye may be found spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. Wow. So if you want to understand why the Book of Mormon, it's because of Jesus Christ, who will bring you spotless into the presence of God. And we should point out, Mike, that the Book of Mormon predates everything in the restoration except the first vision in the sense that the first vision happens but the next major event in the restoration is the receipt of the book of mormon the priesthood is revealed after the book of mormon has been brought forth the release society comes about after the book of mormon the ceiling keys brought back by elijah mm -hmm. yeah. temples after the book of mormon mm -hmm. work for the dead after the Book of Mormon. Doctrines on the family, after the Book of Mormon. The organization of the church, after the Book of Mormon was published. The Book of Mormon is this foundational object, event, item, witness that creates the foundation from which we build the restoration. And this is so critical that we understand the foundation of the restoration centers on the Book of Mormon because it's centered on Jesus Christ. And why? That ye may be found spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. I find that enormously welcoming, inviting, and in my moments of challenge and difficulty, that one final phrase of the title page gives me hope and reminds me where to center my life. I don't know if I had thought about that. That is so powerful, the idea of when I see Jesus Christ again, in order to more fully enjoy that moment, as overwhelming as that's gonna be, my reaction to the Book of Mormon, at least to a degree, is gonna determine what kind of experience that judgment will be. Yeah. Well, we, we can't overemphasize the, how we should treat this holy scripture. So, as we move to the next page, uh, just a reminder, the title page is Scripture. And if you want, you could identify this as Book of Mormon, chapter 0, verses 1 and 2. The introductory page, again, has some explanatory and useful information, giving you a bit of an overview of what you're going to experience in the Book of Mormon. Uh, it is not Scripture, as other Scripture, but it's very useful and insightful. I like how in the first paragraph here, 
it says that the Book of Mormon is a volume of Holy Scripture comparable to the Bible. You know, while we rightfully focus on the Book of Mormon, uh, pro prophets have emphasized that we should be reading the Book of Mormon every day. But sometimes in our culture, I think sometimes uh, we really like to emphasize that we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it's translated correctly. And, you know, in 2 Nephi, is it chapter 27, we're warned that it, some people say a Bible, a Bible, we've got a Bible. And we use that to say, yeah, the Christians out there, they don't want another Bible. They don't want the Book of Mormon. But I wonder sometimes if we could be guilty of saying, hey, a Bible, a Bible, I've already got a Book of Mormon. I don't need the Bible. But we've been told repeatedly that the Book of, the Book of Mormon and the Bible are supposed to run together in order to eliminate contentions and to establish true doctrine about Jesus Christ. You'd mentioned earlier before we turned on the cameras that there's this reference to Ezekiel that you're thinking about, that these two scrolls will be bound together. And this is an important insight that when we talk about another testament of Jesus Christ, it's yet another witness sharing the witness that the Old and New Testament have that God is a covenantal God welcoming us into his covenantal family and of course, there's stipulations and expectations for what we should be doing, but the invitation is there and we should look at these companion volumes that we read the Bible and the Book of Mormon together. I think you had said something like, when we read the Bible with the Book of Mormon, the Bible makes more sense. And when you read the Book of Mormon with the Bible, the Book of Mormon uh, also makes more sense. Right, and here in 2 Nephi chapter three says, uh, the Bible and the Book of Mormon shall grow together unto the confounding of false doctrines and laying down contentions and establishing peace. Yeah. So even though we're going to be focusing this year on scripture insights from the Book of Mormon, same time we don't want to neglect the Bible. So now we turn to the testimony of three witnesses, the testimony of eight witnesses. And I like that the word testimony is related to the word test. In fact, if you uh, block out the emoni, all you have left is test. And what's interesting, Mike, is that when you have an opportunity to bear witness or to testify, it's usually about things that you have tested in your life and then mm. learned something. So when you think about testimony, these witnesses, the three and the eight, went through a test. And from that, they gained knowledge or evidence or they saw and they witnessed and therefore they could testify because of the test they ran to understand if something was true. The word wit is related to, etymologically, the word vision, evidence. So think about what these brothers experienced. They had visions, they gained evidence to see things that were true. And therefore they could testify that they now had seen and handled, they had gained evidence of what was real and true. And what's beautiful is that here we are many generations later and perhaps we ourselves don't get to hold on to the plates. We have these eight people who gave enduring testimony of what they saw and never recanted. I love that. Let's go ahead and look at their testimony here of the three witnesses. They say that they have seen the plates. And then if we skip down a little bit for his voice, meaning God's voice hath declared it unto us. Wherefore, we know of a surety that the work is true. I think it's interesting that historians have compiled at least 150 statements throughout the lives of Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris, where they, in private or public correspondence, they talked about their experience of seeing the gold plates. And there is not one single reliable account where they ever denied or recanted that the experience was real. 
and even on their deathbeds, all three of them affirmed that they had had this experience. I think that's amazing. It is amazing. I've heard people say, well, I think these guys were creating a hoax or trying to delude themselves or others. And if you look carefully at the lives of these, each of these men, there were times when they found themselves in disagreement or out of harmony with Joseph Smith or the church. And yet, like, they, they never denied. And if you're trying to fo foist a hoax on people and the person that you were trying to create the hoax with was Joseph Smith, and you decide like, well, I'm actually kind of out of sorts with him right now, you would probably say, by the way, it was just a big joke. We just, we just deceived everybody. And instead, they continued to emphasize the truth with words of soberness. That's a really interesting word. Today in our language, sober means, well, I'm not drunk. Back in Joseph Smith's day, it was really meant a level of seriousness that we understand the serious nature of the claims we're making and we recognize the consequences of what we're saying and that if we were, are lying to people, that is also extremely consequential, which is to say, we are not lying. We are telling you with the words of truth that you can trust. So we've briefly talked about the testimony of the three witnesses. You can see the eight witnesses, shorter testimony, but has the same impact. And then the testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith. And I actually think it's interesting. We got how many witnesses there? 12. Kind of like the authority of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. I, I don't know if that was intentional or not, but I think that's kind of fun. And our friend Tyler Griffin has said, of all the witnesses that matter the most, your witness. Mm -hmm. So it should be the 13th witness, your testimony of the Book of Mormon. And that's what the invitation is in this book, is to gain your own witness and testimony that the Book of Mormon is for you as a witness of Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at what we hear from Joseph Smith about the Book of Mormon. I like it, the very end. Is that okay if we jump to the very end? After he's seen Moroni, Angel Moroni, all night long, and, and eventually after four years he gets the plates. I like this, one of the last paragraphs, it says, for no sooner was it known that I had them, the plates, than the most strenuous exertions were used to get them from me. I find it fascinating that the people that knew Joseph Smith the best, not just his own immediate family, but even his enemies treated the plates as a fact. People out there, they'll say that the Book of Mormon is just a hoax, like where, where are the gold plates today? Um, or which museum are they in? And we'll say, um, actually, Joseph Smith came back to the angel Moroni. Okay, likely story. Actually, I have a quick story <laughs> yeah. about that. Uh, when I was in graduate school, at divinity school, I shared that story and somebody asked that question. And they're like, well, that sounds really convenient yeah. that the plates aren't available. And I said, uh, well, are you, a, are you a Christian? And this was a, a, a Christian school. He said, well, absolutely. And I said, okay, um, so therefore you believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's like, well, that's critical to the foundations of what it means to be a Christian. I'm like, amen to that, show me the body. And he paused, he's like, I see your point, mm. that we all have faith in Jesus Christ in part because of the witnesses and testimonies of other people who did mm. see the bodily resurrection, even though I personally have never seen the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. I see an analogy here with the Book of Mormon that God gave witnesses and tangible evidence for people at that time and enough that they could express their witness. And now today we are invited to exercise some trust and faith, just like we do that I trust that Jesus was resurrected, even though I wasn't there 2000 years ago to watch it happen. Sometimes people, when they hear me on social media or in person even, they'll, they'll sometimes say, well, Mike, you're just engaging in apologetics or this is just wishful thinking in your part that Joseph Smith really had gold plates and that by the power of God he translated them. And well, yes, my, my conviction, my testimony is based on faith, but I think it's so encouraging that it's also based on historical fact. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph, people knew that Joseph Smith had a record. 
He didn't fabricate it. That's an historical proven fact. Yeah, it is compelling, as you're pointing out. It's not just his friends and family who want to make him look good. The enemies, the people who really wanted to make him look bad, they acted in such a way that they also knew that the plates existed. Otherwise, would the, why would they put forth so much exertion to get access to them? Like if they all thought it was a hoax, then they should have just not bothered and wasted their time. So why do we share all this? Again, it comes back to the beginning of the Book of Mormon year. The invitation is every week for you to build your own testimony witness that Jesus is the Christ for you. And the Book of Mormon can guide you to understanding him better and you can come to know for yourself that these evidences, these stories of how people either stayed in covenant or out of covenant and what the consequences were and how God was faithful at all times, all that can lead you back into his presence if we choose to be faithful. And I'm so grateful that Joseph Smith was faithful to our Savior Jesus Christ and what a wonderful witness of the reality of Jesus Christ we have here. So I want to turn back to the title page of the Book of Mormon. And I want to focus on the title itself, the Book of Mormon. The best proposal about the meaning of the name Mormon might help us to better understand what the theme or thesis of the Book of Mormon is. Now we've been trying to clarify that. We think the title page does a very good job. What I find compelling, Mike, is that the name Mormon itself likely also contains the meaning of the message. And the word Mormon comes from two Egyptian words, more, which means love, and moan, which means enduring forever. And you put those together, it means love endures forever. And whose love are we talking about? But God's. So implicit in the name, Mormon is God's love endures forever. That's a pretty good title. Yeah. For the book. So let's think about it. You could actually translate the title as the book of God's love endures forever. Now, I'm not advocating we change the name of the Book of Mormon, but that really, if you translated literally out of the ancient Egyptian, that's what it'd read. And if that's what we're hearing all the time, I love the book of God's love endures forever, it might help us remember much more often that that is the purpose of the book. It is about God's love. And I would like to conclude with my testimony of the Book of Mormon, which is very simple. That the Book of Mormon is the most literarily beautiful, doctrinally truthful, and everlastingly applicable book I have ever encountered. Thank you for your love of the Lord and for your time engaging in gospel and scripture study. And may the Lord bless you on your ongoing path of seeking his presence in your life. Mm -hmm.